we're back to the rolling. All right. All right, this is Miles with EIKelona.com, and today we're getting to know Sean Gray. Now, for those who aren't aware of Sean or don't know exactly who he is, uh, he's a very, very uh, well-established and highly regarded guitar player, amongst other things. And we're probably going to talk largely about that today, but he's also a great songwriter and is involved in a number of projects in around Kelowna and has been for a long time. Sean came here by way of uh, Toronto, by way of New York, by way of wherever the whole story started. So <laughs> that's what we're going to do, Sean, if you don't mind. You know, I'd like sure. to talk about you know, what, you know, what turned you on to music to start with before you even decided that you wanted to be a guitar player. Um, yeah, I took guitar lessons, or sorry, I took piano lessons when I was in, when I was five. Okay. I loved my parents forever. I want to play, I want to play piano. I don't know why, but I just wanted to play piano. So they bought me, bought me this, uh, it was like a hundred year old piano. <laughs> it still had the candelabra wow. things on it, no candles. They probably already, already burned off a hundred years ago. But, you know, and it, it stayed in tune. No, it didn't. <laughs> but it was really cool. You know, and uh, so I, I took some lessons, and this is in Scotland. Okay. And I uh, went to grades one through four in Scotland. My dad was in the oil business, so we traveled around and lived many, many different places. So yeah, I started in grade five, and then we moved to, uh, sorry, I was, sorry, five years old. And then we had moved to Denver, Colorado, and I think I was 12, and I was still playing piano, just taking lessons and stuff. And... Uh, my parents said, oh, do you want to go see the Buddy Holly story? Remember the Buddy Holly story of Gary mm -hmm. Busey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, eh, not really. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know who Buddy Holly was. And it's like, when you're 12, it's like, yeah, I'd rather just go hang out with my friends, play some baseball, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, so I went with them, and uh, I left wanting to play guitar. Just like that. And I've never turned, never, it's never, I've never had a stronger hobby. I've never had another career choice other than... You know, well, I started professionally when I was 18, but up to that, I was all I thought about was guitar. Mm. And uh, yeah, and then funny enough, Buddy Holly died. You know, that the day yeah. the music died, he yeah. died on February 3rd, 1959, and I was born on February 3rd, 1966. Wow! So every birthday, I would hear Buddy mm -hmm. Holly tunes on the radio, which is kind of funny. I didn't think that at the time, but right. I just remember seeing him playing that telly and that strat. You know, and just, just that whole thing, just, oh, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Knowing that you've gone to school to study, mm -hmm. um, and knowing how important an instrument piano is considered to be in terms of compositionally and those sorts of things, uh, did you carry that? Was there enough of what you learned over those seven years of studying piano to really help fuel or make it easier for you to attend music college? Um, yeah, I think I think learning any instrument, even delving in a little bit to it, will help you for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't compose on piano, okay. which is weird. I mean, I know a lot of people compose on I compose on guitar. You know, I've learned the guitar enough that I can sort of make it the portable orchestra and do my do what I need to get out of it. You mean you know where all the notes are? All five? Are there more than five? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but no, piano was. Piano was great because I mean you have the full spectrum of, you know, of every instrument ever played is the there. piano. So yeah. when I took arranging in music school, it was great because I could write out parts. Like, oh, okay, this is. So I hear we, that we've that come arranged. from Scotland to Denver. You were, so when did you start gigging and where were you living when you started? Uh, I was in Calgary. Okay. And I went to um, I played played guitar in high school stage band just for yep. grade 10 but mm -hmm. i lived two buses and an lrt away from school wow and back then there were no over the shoulder gig bags or just those hard plastic things you know mm -hmm. those cases and i had the you know that remember that adidas mm -hmm. shuffle yeah, the yeah, yeah. bag they wouldn't had with yep. crack first cold day it was i had that and my guitar and i'd go and and i didn't like the band teacher and you know he didn't like me and i probably probably because i showed up late all the time and I wasn't really into it and <laughs> yeah but they don't tend to not like that. they do yeah and, and rightfully so so I just I gave up with that but I was always in a sort of a garage band in, in high school and then I went to post-secondary at Mount Royal 
so college. And what were you studying in there? Uh, music. I went so to it the, was music yeah. and you started there. It's called the Studio Music Program. It was based on the Humber program. Okay. And uh, it was a two year program. And uh, I was I was I started the second year of his its existence. So okay. it was still new and yeah, it was great. Do you recall who the uh, guitar chair was? Yeah, that? Jimmy Chu. Yeah, Jim Chu was my my teacher. Okay. And that actually uh, my good friend Lonnie Moger, local guitar guru around here too i mean he we both studied with both from calgary we both had mm-hmm. jim chu as a teacher it's funny very very cool yeah so, so mount royal was before you in new york yes okay yeah. and that's when i started playing professionally was not too far into getting into mount royal okay so what type of i mean what genre what type of gigs were you were you doing at that point in time uh they were jazz gigs okay i mean they weren't like you know knock it out of the park jazz gigs but mm-hmm. they were or we were playing knock it out of the park jazz <laughs> but I mean, we had our real book and satin doll do 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 still learning those minor seven to g oh i can play a g7 sharp five but okay you know those sort of things learning on the gig and it was yeah. but again we we played a lot we played for cheap well, that's, so, that's those two often go hand in hand. Unfortunately, yeah. in, in most music scenes yeah. around North America, unfortunately, you guys play for five hours. Sure, for pasta, sure. <laughs> but I learned satin doll pretty well. <laughs> so, so, for those people around town that aren't aware of just how broad your musical knowledge is, um, I mean, you are recognized and respected as you know a top drawer jazz guitar player, no doubt. Um, you're not too bad in the country field, too. I mean, you could play a little. And that, that's well, a, a yeah. term of endearment that we use when, when somebody we think is amazing. We say, yeah, they can play a little. Yeah. You can you. play a little. You know, well, it's it, funny. With the jazz thing, I went, I went down the rabbit hole of jazz, right? And to learn anything well, you really have to sort of have the blinders on, just do that. So I was, you know, I, when I lived in, I studied at the Manhattan School of Music, and I studied with various guys around town big name guys around town being New York. Yeah. Pretty big town. Yeah. And uh, and I moved to Toronto and played jazz, nothing but jazz for most of my career there, which is okay. 25 okay. years, okay. you know. But I then I started getting into country music. But before you, we go there, was, I mean, you taught at, in Toronto as well. I taught in Toronto. I also taught at Red Deer College. Okay. In Red Deer. Just after I had, it was in between graduating from Mount Royal College and in Calgary and moving to New York. Um, Jim Chu, who was the guitar teacher at Mount Royal, he had six students at the time at Red Deer College. Okay. It's an hour drive, mm-hmm. roughly. And um, he would, he just got too busy. So when I had graduated and I was starting to play around town, he said, do you want the gig? I said, oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that gig turned out to be, went from six students to, they had just got this big grant from the government to make it a, you know, mm-hmm. really make it a thing. So went from, yeah, just half a day to four days a week. Nice. So it was Monday through Thursday. I'd come back Thursday night and put me up at a hotel. Mm-hmm. I taught combos. I taught, it was, it was great. Well, that had to be fun. So in order to do that, you were studying more than just guitar at Mount Royal, you're studying composition and... Yeah, composition and arranging and that sort of stuff. Were you getting into the business study side of it at Mount Royal? Did that come later at Manhattan? Not, or? I never really studied business. It was just out of... My dad was a, you know, or still is, a businessman, so he'd always, mm-hmm. you know, give me tips about, oh, you got to make sure that they know when you're going to start, make sure you know when you're going to end and how much you're going to get paid, and mm-hmm. you know. And then I just, just out of necessity because... Being a freelance musician, you know, it's you gotta like like right now. I'm either gigging, like performing, or getting performance opportunities by right. calling, emailing, connecting. You know, right. so there's never a dull moment. But you have to do that. You have to have some sort of business sense. But no, I never took any formal. Okay. Here's a contract. I did not know that. Yeah. That's cool. So this is still all jazz. Primarily, yeah, and clearly, there's there's more than just a familiarity with the genre of country music. 
it's obvious that you you really like the genre. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I really do. And I mean, growing up in Alberta too. Well, grades nine through two years after college, I was in Alberta. So pretty formative years, Calgary Stampede, all that sort of stuff. I was still playing jazz, but I always, you know, if I heard a a well played Telecaster, I'd always like, wow, what is that? Mm-hmm. That is so cool, you know. So. You always play Telly now. What were you playing back then? No, telly, back? telly was, uh, I had a Strat, Strats and Tellys, basically, both, uh, mainly, but uh, it's funny, like, I have I have a lot of guitars, you know, and, you know, like, someone said, oh, what's your spirit animal? You know, I think your spirit animal is a grizzly bear, you know. If my spirit guitar would be the Telecaster. There you go. Like, it just, I've learned to play the Telecaster, in ways that I can't do things on other guitars, like behind the nut bends and volume swells and, you know. So was that influenced at all by, I mean, Canadian legend Ed Bickert, or did you just, that was the first thing you picked up at a music store? And Yeah, no, it? actually I, I played, I love Ed Bickert, Ed Bickert is, you know, I actually got to know him, oh, cool. which is very cool, but uh, yeah, he was, he was, in my opinion, one of the best guitar players ever, but I, I had a telly before I knew who Ed Bickert was. Okay. Oh, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, so. Well, and it's. Uh, I know you won't bring it up, but but you, because you brought up your ranking of Ed, I mean, you have been referred to as one of the top fifty Canadian guitar players of all time. It's about my mom, I think. No. <laughs> ah, yeah, we know that's not true. But but again, you know, I think for Kelowna people that, you know maybe see you in different situations but don't really know who you are mm. yeah there's a reason that you gig a lot there's a reason that you're involved in a lot of the best projects in town uh, that's certainly a large part of it so when did country start pre- was it just because you're hearing it you know, as far as the live music scene was in calgary was it pretty much largely country or was it more diverse than that um i don't I, I, funny i didn't play any country in calgary oh i filled in for a for someone at a Calgary Stampede breakfast thing, I think. Mm-hmm. So I had to learn a bunch of Waylon Jennings tunes, and it's, I didn't. It wasn't as if I like killed the gig. It's like okay, I got <laughs> through it, but I got a taste of how you know what it what it was about, you know. And, uh, and when I say country, I don't mean bro country. I don't mean talking about Budweisers and Daisy right. Dukes and Chevrolets, but yeah. actual traditional country where there's you know. Like Don Rich and Roy Nichols, those right. two guys, and right. on through, you know, Brent Mason and all the, the newer guys, that sort of country, you know. If you had to, you know, name some jazz players that were major influences on you as a guitar player, as well as some country guys, yeah, who would they be? Um, definitely Ed Bickert. You couldn't avoid, not that you'd want to avoid, but you couldn't avoid the influence of Ed Bickert, yeah. you know. Um, especially when I moved to Toronto, it was like all the guitar players that were born in Toronto had some connection, some to, connection to learning from Ed Bicker, right. whether it be record or in person. Um, Pat Metheny, of course, John Schofield, uh, John Abercrombie. I, had, I, had to, I was fortunate enough to have studied with John, and he was fantastic. Was that in New York? That was in New York, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, Bill Frizzell. Uh, Derek Trucks, yep. like guys who just rip it up. I mean, Derek Trucks isn't a jazz player, but but you know, but he's he's an amazing. Actually, I hate when people say "but" he's not a jazz player. I should <laughs> rephrase that because I remember talking about Ray Charles, a mm-hmm. jazz person. I said, "Oh, I love Ray Charles. Well, I like him, but he's not a jazz player." I'm like, who cares? It's Ray Charles. Charles exactly. It's amazing. So sorry, I'll take "but" out of there. <laughs> Yeah, all these all these players are just guitar players, are just musicians that happen to play in different genres, and sometimes right. not even strictly in those genres, you know. Well, and it's interesting because a couple of guys you mentioned were almost fall into that. Was it ECM? Was that the label that was doing all ECM, that? ECM, yeah. Right. Yeah. That whole because I listened to Abercrombie a lot during Ooh. that phase in Tertiary Building and. and yeah, a lot yeah. of these guys that were just doing the Gateway Trio we had. Yeah, I mean those are some of the them. most amazing albums of all time yeah, in yeah. my book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's a long way from some the more mainstream guys. So it's neat that you were exposed to that. Was it people 
at school in New York that were exposing you to these people, or how did you come to listen to these other players? No, just by, just by uh, when I lived in Calgary, you know, I just I I went and bought uh, Downbeat magazine every month. Okay. Uh, Billy's News, which is on uh, oh, what's the, the the streetcar track. I haven't lived in Calgary for a long time. Anyway, it's right downtown. Okay. And they had like you know fifty seven thousand different magazines back when people read magazines. Sad they don't anymore. I love magazines, but but they had downbeat. So every, every downbeat would have an article on someone, or articles on people, and also mm -hmm. record reviews. Right. You know? I can remember seeing a review of uh, got really into Mike Stern, a huge Mike Stern. Right. right. And uh, Mike Stern had played on a Harvey Schwartz record, Urban Earth. So I. I went to Sam the Record Man downtown Calgary, see if they could order it. They could order it. Even back then, it was like twenty some odd bucks. Wow! It was because it was like an import, right? You know, they probably cut nine of them. And I had <laughs> one of them, you know. But uh, yeah, and then I they called me like a month later. Oh, the record's in. I took the LRT downtown and you know and and got this record and then put it on old school with the needle right, and right. kept. You serious? Da, da, oh God, yeah. You, you took apart solos. Oh yeah. Oh, I did that so often. Wow. And it's funny because you would actually get it down to, you know, if you go. Oh, there it is. And it would give you a launching pad of what the what he's doing because sometimes. Dedication. Oh, I did that. Oh, I did that tons. Michael Brecker solos, like things that were just John Coltrane, like things that were. Were just you know I couldn't figure out just by listening to it because it was so fast. Right? So, so did you over time uh, develop the, the capacity to hear you know not just notes but like scale fragments and arpeggios and and so you wouldn't have to like you you recognize okay that's just a minor seven a minor nine arpeggio starting on the three kind of oh, thing. Oh, oh definitely yeah yeah right so that just becomes part of yeah. the awareness as a player so yeah it becomes a little bit easier to do that than in the early days when it really is one note at a time. Yeah, oh for sure, yeah. 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 So along there, you started listening to some country guys, I guess, right? Yeah. So who were they and how did you stumble across them? Actually, Albert Lee, fabulous player, I heard him play with Clapton fan. Okay. Here, Eric Clapton fan, okay. I love Eric Clapton, he was right. He still is right. And um, Albert Lee was in his band. And then they did a few um, sort of countryish, mm -hmm. you know, Tulsa time and things like that right. that are basically country tunes. You yeah. know, and uh, Albert Lee would kind of he let them rip a bit, you know. And I was like, wow, what is that? And the Doobie Brothers actually, minute by minute, the last two songs on minute by minute has Jeff Skunk Baxter playing a country Telecaster thing. That's you one of the tunes. Let's go listen. And that's just like, what is that? That is so cool. And that was. That was sort of my entrance into, other than going to the Stampede and, you know, being in Calgary, that was my entrance into well, wanting to delve deeper into it. And I listened, well, I, I should say, let's do, I used to buy Guitar Player Magazine religiously. Yeah, so do I, and, so do. And yeah, Albert digitally. Lee <laughs> had that column for the longest time. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. and I would shed that stuff over and over and over and over again because yeah. it was just so different yeah, than yeah. anybody else that I was listening to. and. And it sounded so cool when you could actually pull it off. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. So, Albert Lee, uh, did you get into the John Jorgensen thing and all that and the Helicaster? The Helicaster, uh, after. Okay. I, I heard them all. They're, you know, they're obviously great, yeah. And then it was, uh, it was really into my jazz phase. Then Bill Frizzell put out a record called Nashville. Okay. I have not heard that album. Oh, it's great. And it has Allison Krauss, was a big, really helped him, and Jerry Douglas really helped him get players. Okay. You know, for it. And um, yeah, it's, it's fabulous, mm -hmm. you know. And that was it was Bill Frizzell playing. I mean, he still plays that Americana. Yep. Filtered through the the brilliant mind of Bill Frizzell, you yes. know. But so that was that was a big, that was a huge turning point. That really sort of influenced my Peach Band stuff. Okay. Like I want to start doing more of that stuff, you know. So you, you I haven't been aware of you being able to gig that much locally. Uh, how is are, have you been doing some of it? Is there more in the works for more of those gigs? Oh, or? the Peach Band? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing uh, December 17th at the Vernon Jazz Club. Okay. Yeah. So that's with uh, Lonnie Moger on acoustic guitar. Um, 
Dave Mehal on drums, mm -hmm. who I played with. The, actually, both those guys are in songs with the Southern Bells. Right. And um, Bernie Addington on bass. So it's and it's great hearing Bernie play that stuff because Bernie's a jazz guy. He, he is totally a jazz guy. You know, but he he really plays this stuff. You know, I remember saying to him one time we first got together playing these songs, and he said, "Is that kind of something? Is that what you what you're thinking of?" And of course, he always yeah, you know, he's a great player. And I said, "Well, maybe a third of that." He goes, "Okay," and he really sort of broadened it out. Yeah, and just got rid of a bunch of stuff, so you could hold, you know, ding, ding, dong, ding, bong, bong, as opposed to do, 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 boo, boo, do, boo, do, boo, 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 do, ba, right? Because it lets everything sort of breathe, and that was great. Yeah, I gave him two very enthusiastic thumbs up when he. So yeah. if you look at the current projects. There's that. There's songs of the Southern Bells, and you guys are gigging that again soon. Yeah. In, in December out at Creekside Theater. Yeah, December 11th, um, yeah. And I remember talking to you either just before or just after the big show you put on at Mary Irwin last mm -hmm. year. Right. And about the desire to, at some point in time, you know, hopefully tour with that. Mm -hmm. And is that still something that you're hoping to do? It is, yeah. We had something in the works pre COVID. Mm -hmm. like a six or seven day tour into Alberta and of course COVID you know there's the elevator shaft and mm -hmm. everyone stepped into it and yeah. and no we definitely want to get that happening for sure yeah it's an amazing show with, with a, and a you know a lot of very 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 good players in it yeah we've really you know the, the personnel has changed over the years some have stayed and some have gone and we've got new people and I really like the new configuration with uh, Shama Sabir mm -hmm. singing. Who's she's got a great voice, it really does. It's one of the things that surprised me when yeah. I came up to hear you guys and and mentioned it in our yeah Kelowna review was. Mm. I mean, yeah, she's an insane player. Yeah, I Oops. knew her as a fiddle player from playing with her with Cod. Right. Sometimes when she'd fill in for Susan Naylor. Yeah. And uh, she was great, but yeah, hearing her, she said, oh, "I wouldn't mind singing a couple tunes." Absolutely. So, you heard her nice sing and then of, uh, more tunes. You know. And she did an Anne Murray tune that night, I believe. Yes. So, yeah. Wow. Snowbird. Yeah. Yeah, with her and Lonnie. It was it, great. It, it, very soulful and, and yeah. their voice sounded great on it. Yeah. So, because we're talking about vocalists for a second, you can sing a little too. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, you know, and it's, it's, I know people that I've sat with at shows for songs, or you with Gray & Co., right. the duo that you do with, with Michaela. Right. Um, they just said, man, I had no idea you could sing. And, and these are like well-respected male vocalists around town going, Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, so Duke can sing. Nice. So, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I enjoy singing. It's, it's a... Uh, as much you know. as, in addition to... Um, um, like, I'm still a guitar player. Like, it's funny, like, learning, my nemesis is learning lyrics. Okay. Like I can, I can look at a, sh look at a piece of music and, not like I'm Rain Man, I can't memorize right. it instantly, but I can very quickly memorize it. Mm -hmm. So I can turn away and I don't have to look at it. Right. right? And, uh, but lyrics, even tunes I've written are like, oh, that's the, t that's the, <laughs> you know, I, I really enjoy singing, but I'm definitely a guitar player. First, second, and third. Big sure. show. Yeah. Um, do you, are, are there vistas out there that you have yet to embark upon as a guitar player? Are there things that you, things that still drive you to learn more? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I took some lessons again going down the, the country rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. down. I took some lessons, actually, a number of lessons with Brent Mason. Okay. Who's like the country. He's been on every every second country record since 1988. Yeah, he's, basically, right? He's a legend and a monster, and yeah. you know all those things combined. And, yeah, and um, you know, probably one of the most recorded guitarists of all time in any genre. Yeah, yeah. So he even did guitar for Friends that show. Like things that you wouldn't think he's okay. on. It's like yeah, he's he's. Um, yeah, he's great, and, be, and you know we become friends, and it's really nice. So, so uh, 
did, I mean, did you get to take a bunch of lessons with him? And... A bunch of lessons. I went, I've been to his house. I've been out. He uh, had to take a cab to his house. It was pretty far away from downtown, and he felt mm-hmm. bad about it, so he drove me back to, I was staying right downtown on right. Uh, De Mombrian. Okay, yeah. yeah. At the Comfort Inn, right? and uh, so he drove me back, and he says, what are you doing later on? I said, nothing. He goes, well, let's go out for a, a beer and burger. So he took me out for a beer and burger, and we, you know, talked about gig stories, and it's funny talking with a guy like that. I had to say, oh yeah, I had this funny gig. I was playing a bar mitzvah in Toronto, you know, and he goes, oh, I was playing with Willie Nelson for Paul Simon's anniversary tour, and, you know, I was like... <laughs> There's a little bit of a difference. In the... But he showed great enthusiasm for my bar mitzvah story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, like, the, my, uh, the, the, the people that I've met, the, the ones that are really, like, top drawer, mm-hmm. have always been, with, with the exception of one guy, it's a different mm-hmm. story, but totally welcoming, totally yeah. open, totally friendly, you know, and it's, it's sort of that next rung down. Mm-hmm. That they're really good, but they're not like legends, but they're really good. Then you start getting, sometimes you get guys with attitude, like right. they kind of vibe you out on the bandstand and <laughs> see if they can throw you off by playing, you know, a bit out of time and in time and that sort of stuff. But it was always the main guys. Like I've met like Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, Pat Metheny, John Schofield, Michael Brecker a couple of times, Mike Stern. I mean, all those guys mm-hmm. and Brent Mason and, you know, and they've all been super nice, super down to earth, just like. Well, I, I think maybe that's because of two things. They certainly don't have anything to, to prove to anybody anymore. No, and they're not threatened by you. Right? They're, they're not, not threatened, threatened by you. And, and they also <coughs> know how hard they had to work to get there. So you're involved in so many projects, Sean. Um, it's sometimes hard to keep up with them all. So Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm not alone then. <laughs> so what... What is consuming your time? What are you pouring your, investing your time into? What are you excited about these days? Um, actually, I've got a bunch of things coming up. One is the Rocky Mountain High, a John, an, an Evening with John Denver, it's the full title, it's with Rick Worrell yeah. and Lee Holdridge, who was the original arranger conductor for John. Now, you're doing that here and elsewhere, I think, aren't you? Yeah, we're doing three nights here at the Kelowna Community Theater. So it's an eight-piece band. Um, and Rick sings most of it. His brother Steve Worrell also sings some tunes, but it's uh, it's with the full orchestra, and we use a different orchestra in every city. And Lee Holdridge conducts the orchestra. It, am I recollecting correctly? I think that's what I'm trying to say. Grammatically, <laughs> <correctly. laughs> uh, that it's a Christmas special. It is a Christmas show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we're doing three nights here, November twenty fourth to twenty sixth. And I don't know all the dates off the top of my head. I know I'm out of, I'm gone for a long time. Then we, we play Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg. Wow. Um, not in that order, that number. It's a legit but tour. It's a legit tour, yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm playing acoustic and electric for it, which is going to be fun. And uh, yeah, so I'm learning all those John Denver tunes, it's, it's great, yeah. So that's one of the projects, but I but yeah. I know you're also got a Songs of the Southern Bells gig coming up. Yes, uh, Songs of the Southern Bells at the Creekside Theater, December eleventh, and um, that's with Kinga Hemming, of course, who's the main bell, and Shama Sabir, who mm-hmm. great fiddle player and great singer. She sings. Uh, David Mihal, Stefan Bienz on bass, okay. and um, Lonnie Moffat for myself, and then Layer Cake Mountain, another group that. Shama Sabir has put together mm-hmm. sort of a bluegrass rootsy group okay um, with Bex it's kind of an interesting group of people Bex is in it uh, Stefan Bienz myself and Shama and I'm playing all acoustic and and Bex plays acoustic and banjo and mm-hmm. it's it's really cool so Layer Cake Mountain is opening for Songs of the Southern Bells oh neat yeah now Never I, have them, I, know. Ask, I have to ask I have to ask is there going to be nice four part harmonies in these bluegrass tunes? Oh, we have some great harmonies. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and it's it's kind of it's it's kind of bluegrass. It's not it's not like one genre. Like mm-hmm. we do some of my originals. We do some of Bex's originals, some of Shama's, and um, and just some a variety of other tunes. It's a really good band. Really fun. 
So that's all on December 11th. So, so that's three projects. Um, I got my uh, Sean Bray's Peach Band, which I said that's Bernie, Lonnie, and um, David Mehal. Right. We're playing the Vernon Jazz Club December 17th. So that's a, that's all my original Americana, but through the lens of a jazz guy. Just for the, for those people that aren't aware, even I forget how many albums you've got out. How many albums do you have out, Sean? Uh, I think I have. I have six. Okay. I think so. Now sounds sounds arrogant. Oh, I think I have six, but I I think I have six. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Like yeah. So where can people find those? My basement. Got tons of them. <laughs> <laughs> A couple under my fridge. Uh, you know, okay. No. But uh, level it all out. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, iTunes. Mm-hmm. Nobody okay. goes to iTunes anymore. You can go to Apple Music and Spotify, which is like kind of rummaging through someone's house when they're not mm-hmm. home. But anyways, that's that's cool. At least people can go see it, go hear it, and yeah. Sean, thank you for inviting us in today and spending a little bit of time with us and you know letting us in on you know what got you here those earliest years plunking away on piano and and uh, the hundred year old piano yeah <laughs> how Buddy you know, the Buddy Holly show you know was such a impactful moment and how that led you on this journey now that has led you to be recognized as one of the top Canadian guitar players of all time. Um, we appreciate what you've brought to the scene. Um, well, thank you. And the, and the level of quality that that has, you know, I'm not going to say spawned, but furthered, because there's a lot of very good players in this town. Oh, absolutely, so yeah. To have someone like you come along and just add to that, it's, it's been very uh, rewarding to see. Hmm. So thank you for your time this morning, and thank you for what you bring to Kelowna. Thank you, and thank you for EI Kelowna and all that, all that Miles over and does for everyone. Mm-hmm. Your great photography, and uh, yeah. So right back at you. But thank you. All right.